Let me start five past the hour and I don't, I'll keep uh, adding people as they join, but I want to welcome Duke and uh, Doug, I, I, uh, it's so happy to have you here, Doug. Uh, I know you made the time, it's tight, you're busy with the launch of your book, so uh, thank you so much for spending a bit of time with us, telling you about your knowledge, what you've learned, and, and how can, yeah, um, can we get better? Uh, you've seen all the profile of Doc, he's an exec, very successful, one of the top, or the top uh, coach for CEOs, um, so I'm sure we'll have a very interesting discussion and, and session uh, with you. So I'm looking forward, Doc. I don't know, you want to share some slides or just uh, we just have some dialogue, whatever you prefer. I'm going to do a little bit of slides, uh, but also want to just say a huge thank you um, to be in your group. I watched several of your videos and you've had such rock stars on. I'm very uh, privileged to uh, be invited. So thank you very much, Antonio. Thank uh, you. I do. You, uh, let's yes. So um, I'll share the screen with you. Okay. Now you should be able to. All right. So let's see. Um, well, first, um, I do want to, you know, talk a bit about um, good old uh, COVID, right? So I'm in Houston. You guys are all around the world. So um, this last weekend, uh, really luckily, uh, I got an email that said, hey, um, there is two kids that really want to come to America, but their host families and the exchange student program canceled. Would you be interested in hosting them? And so over the weekend, I've agreed to uh, host two new uh, high school students that are going to come and hang out for 10 months. And one is coming from Czech Republic, um, from Prague, basically, where they're done with the COVID situation. The other one is coming from Madrid, um, where um, it's still quite heavy. And here in Houston, we are very still heavy. Um, of course, I, I, I work in my office, um, but um, you know, I do you know, I have to walk in and out with the mask. And when we go desk to desk or office to office, we wear our masks. Um, and so, yeah, it's still very, uh, it's still very big here. And uh, I know some of you guys are from the States. You've seen the different, um, um, different uh, I don't know, um, opinions about uh, I was at the golf course the other day and somebody said, well, on November 3rd, COVID will go away because that's the day of our election. As if the election will cause COVID to go away or because of election, COVID is here because of it. Um, but you know, it's not true, it's insanity. Uh, too many people, matter of fact, a week ago, one of my clients, wife ended up with it and I just happened to be coaching her on her career change. She was talking about, I've never, she's only been here two times in six years. And on her second time, which was a week ago, Monday, uh, three days later, she texted me and said, oh, by the way, I tested positive for COVID. <laughs> um, and so yeah, wow. it's the closest I've got to knowing somebody and actually being in, in the same space. So a few days later, I went and got tested. So I came back negative, which is good. We still wear masks in our office if clients come in. But nonetheless, it's still a very big thing globally. And it's, you know, it's going down in some places, going up in other places. And um, you know, I'm still of the opinion, if we could all just stay home for two full weeks, just everybody on the planet, just everyone stay home two weeks. Um, looking backwards, I'm sure everybody would be very happy to have done that. Yeah. Um, but uh, looking forward, everyone's like, well, no, I've already done it or whatever. Anyway, yeah, so it is what we have to do. And part of... Um, the book actually blind spots kind of talks about this is one of the biggest blind spots ever right yes. yet it's really interesting it's a big blind spot but maybe it's not that big of a blind spot because it's happened before it's happened all around the countries you know in maybe your country before there's been a pandemic that's happened um and um next thing you know it hits the whole globe as if, oh my God, what? Yet it's hit the whole globe a hundred years ago. So it's kind of, it's really kind of, it's kind of, I don't know, interesting how stupid humans can be sometimes. Um, because, you know, for whatever reason, we don't pay attention to what shouldn't uh, be ignored. 
um, and this is one of the things that it's obvious we shouldn't ignore it, yet we have, and in some cases think it's political or some other reasons. So anyway, um, even the pandemic is what I consider a blind spot. I didn't update the book um, for it, but I did put in a pandemic checklist or a recession proof your business checklist. Officially, I'm more of a business coach, a PL coach. Uh, I really help businesses improve their bottom line. And um, can you walk I, us quickly through your career, Doc? It's always nicer sure. to hear from from you. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I've got that um, up a bit here. Let me just make sure it's going to slideshow. Let's see if this works okay. Let me share screen. There we go. All right, can you see that? How's that coming across? Yeah, now it's, it's clear. All right, there we go. All right, so there's the good old graphic of the book, uh, which is now available as of yesterday on Amazon. Um, so, um, you know, A, I'm a PMP, so kind of cool to be in, in the group. Yeah. Um, nice. Ben, been one since I think 06, so we're 14 years in. Um, and I got it because I had built an IT company down there at the bottom, N3 Consulting. I grew it from just me to uh, just under $30 million in revenue. We were making a quarter million dollars of profit. Um, and during that time, I decided to get my PMP because uh, I did a lot of IT work and you know some of the big companies we worked for, Exxon and Chevron and Shell, were in Houston, so lots of energy companies. I was working with people that had their PMP and said, Doug, you, you do projects. You should get your uh, certification. So anyway, <clears throat> I did do that. Um, right. I have been ranked the number one business coach in the world. I was actually just Friday um, awarded Master Coach of, of the Year. Um, and um, what that means is in about 80 countries, about a thousand coaches, um, I was, you know, granted the award of master coach, which means I coach coaches as well as uh, business owners. Been growing businesses 30 years, um, well past 10,000 hours of actual hourly coaching sessions, which is quite interesting to realize that number. Um, after I got of, out of my businesses that I've sold, I was retired, which was 14 years ago at 42. And um, I had a two year non-compete at the close of the end of those two years, I started to look for a job because owning businesses is hard for some of you guys that might own businesses. It's not the easiest thing. So I thought, well, let me go work for somebody else. It's interesting when you own businesses, not too many people want to hire you. Turns out Action Coach, which is a franchise organization um, said, why don't you buy the business by the franchise. Uh, they talked me into it and um, it did take me four years to go from coach 1181 to coach number one. Um, and uh, it's been quite a ride. Um, now I've been in the real coaching business for 11 solid years, started my 12th year uh, last month. So um, yeah, so it's, it's quite interesting um, helping people think differently um, act differently, um, learn different things. And in all of this time, uh, being in the MG100 with Antonio and a few other of you guys, um, uh, I was coached into writing my book. And so my first book, I've been in other books or partial chapters of books and things like that. But this is the first time I've actually put together all my thoughts, coordinated into a model that I think is quite valuable to all size businesses and even employees. And um, so I'm gonna cover a little bit of that today. And also maybe if you're willing, um, have some interaction here to help us think through what are blind spots and how blind spots may exist in your world. And if you would recognize them, first be aware of the blind spot and then start doing something about it then you will probably be more successful yourself and all the organizations you work with. I want to learn that, Doc. All right, good, good. All right, well, as first, the good old definition of a blind spot, right? So, you know, it's that part of the optic nerve and the retina that's insensitive to light. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have had this 
happen. Hopefully not, and hopefully it doesn't happen to you, but uh, I've had a detached retina. So um, detached retina, I was traveling. I love to take cruises. Um, well, I used to love to take cruises. Anyway, um, you know, I was actually in Portugal on a little castle tour just on the bus. And next thing you know, my left eye goes blind. It just goes to nothing. And my retina had detached. Um, so I learned a lot about eyes and, and all of that. And so it got repat, it got patched and everything's fine. It's almost perfect. It's about 98% perfect. Uh, but you know, from an anatomy perspective, the blind spots on the eye, you don't see something anymore. It's insensitive to light, but then also, um, you know, an area where a person's view is obstructed, right? So, the, you know, cars, there's a blind spot, right? Both sides of the car is typically a blind spot, but blind spot is something you just don't see it's not even visible. You have no clue that it exists. Um, as a project manager, in the very beginning of coaching, um, I was being coached. Actually, right at the beginning, I had three different coaches. I had a business coach. I had a, um, uh, a group coach that helped us uh, do marketing and sales to get new customers. Um, and in, in the process of being coached, I was made aware of a blind spot. And that blind spot could be a very common blind spot for project managers. And it's because of what we tend to be focused on is structure, organization. And the blind spot of being a business coach, in my case, was the blind spot of emotion. And so helping people become better has a lot to do with emotions because people actually buy emotion, they validate it with logic. And if you're gonna be in business for yourself, people are gonna buy an emotion. 80, 80% is on emotion, the other percentage is validated on logic. So if I'm a very logical person, which I am, and I'm ignoring the bigger part, it was a blind spot. So it turns out I went to a, a, a PMI conference here in Houston, and I met my future thought coach. And my thought coach, help me eliminate the blind spot of emotion. So um, it's first becoming aware of it and then taking action on it. So uh, blind spots are quite interesting. Um, how do we know they exist? Usually you don't know they exist until somebody tells you or something happens and now it's an awareness. Um, so I like to start um, most everything that I ever teach is about the point of power. And the point of power, it's, it's an option. We can be below the point of power and being in blame, excuse, denial. We can be above the point of power, have ownership, accountability, responsibility, officially below the point, we're powerless, above the point, we're powerful. This is one of the slides that we teach from Action Coach. Again, in 80 countries, 18,000 plus people we help every week by helping them get back above the point. All humans, including myself, fall below the point. You may be married to somebody who's always below the point, or they may be married to somebody who's always below the point. It's a very common thing to go into blame mode or excuse mode or denial mode. And really, it's, it's gonna happen. Somebody cuts you off on the freeway, you may be saying to them, how dare you cut me off? Most likely, you're blaming them for cutting you off because you're running late. If somebody cuts in front of you, you don't really care unless you're trying to get someplace fast. So traffic is always one of the things I like to use a great example about people falling below the point. The other one is the economy. Economy is one of the things that people love to use as an excuse for their business not growing. Now, I do tend to focus on small businesses. Some of you guys may have small businesses, right? And the economy in a small business world is absolutely irrelevant. Because your area of business is probably significantly large. It, it doesn't matter. Even if only work with, let's say, um, Oh, what, restaurants. You only work with restaurants. And all of a sudden, the restaurants have to close because of COVID. Well, could you instead, blaming the economy or blaming COVID,
go out to every restaurant here and say, hey, let's figure out how you pivot, how you change your business and grow your business instead of shrink your business. You'd be back above a point, right? Um, and it, it happens all of the time um, about getting back above the point. And really, when I think of blind spots, I, I was thinking, well, is blind spots about being in denial? And I don't know. Is blind spot actually denial or not? Actually, I kind of think blind spot is below denial. <laughs> like, you know, it's one of those things that um, denial is it's there. <laughs> blind spot is I don't even know it's there. And so it's sort of gray, denial and blind spot. The, it's just interesting how far below the point blind spot is. Right? Once you're aware of it, you could deny it exists. Then you're definitely in denial and someone's got to tell you you're in denial um, versus blind spot. So it's just an interesting concept. And I just wonder, you know, do you guys work with people where you see lots of below the point um, situations, people in blame, excuse or denial. I'm curious, anybody wanna come Doc, on mute and- I wanted to ask you because in projects we use the concept of risks management. Is this somehow mm -hmm. connected to risk management and the black swan or not at all? Yeah, it's for something sure. different. No, no, I think it, I think it, den it can be compared to and in, in parallel of because uh, both black swan um, and risk management is understanding are you below the point by not doing it, right? You're know, like, well, but that's not my problem. That's their problem, right? And when it comes to all areas of business, are you in denial or a blind spot? And I, I've broken my book out into basically five different pillars. I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but, you know, it's getting people out of this place of powerlessness and into powerfulness, out of, you know, not being in control and being controlled, even with the stinking COVID virus. You know, it, it's truly being... Um, you know, stuck at home, can't do anything, can't go anywhere, or, you know, get yourself masks, get out there, do things. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was, um, you know, thinking about vacations. So from whatever, March, so I could jump, came back from my last cruise to Australia on March 1st, COVID was going on in, in Asia, uh, China, um, and um, not really hit the US yet. So come back March 1st, don't go on any vacations, tend to go on at least one vacation a quarter, actually had seven cruises planned this quarter. So absolutely no vacations from wow. March until August. Now, I read, hmm, it's time to do something. I don't wanna get on an airplane, I don't wanna stay in a hotel room. So let's rent an RV, All right? Recreational vehicle, those, you know, you drive your home, right? So. Go to rent one. Well, I tried for 10 days. They weren't available in America. I couldn't rent one anywhere in any state. So I bought one. <laughs> so I bought one and now it's a rental. So went on a little golf vacation around Southern US states uh, for 10 days. So that my little vacation. But that's an example of going from below the point to above the point. How do you do what you need to do, right? Um, and you, you, know, you just figure out what to do. You didn't actually have to buy an RV. I could have said, all right, how do I go to hotels or motels? And basically, if you go to those that have uh, external air conditioners, meaning the window AC units, um, then you're controlling all your space. And there's ways around it if we just work on it. And that's really what we do with risk management. Right? But you gotta get them out of denial and say, all right, what are you gonna do? How would we do this? And it goes into all five pillars of a business, right? And so this is just uh, a, a quick overview of some of the things in each of the five pillars. So the five pillars go across the top. So marketing, sales, operations, finance, and team. And what's below here is just a couple ideas of um, things that are typically blind spots for business owners. 
So I'll just kind of give a few examples. Uh, marketing, right? So marketing departments and bigger companies know cost per lead. If a company is doing less than say 10 million US a year, they have no stinking idea what a cost per lead is. They just want more leads. But when they actually do the math and figure out what the cost per lead is, and then determine how many leads it takes to get a customer, then and only then do they understand how marketing really works. And one of the things we teach is about buying customers. You go out and you buy a lead, you go out and buy a customer. If you guys have a business, it's exactly the same thing. There's a cost associated with marketing. And when you calculate it into what does it take to really get a customer, lead generation is just a math formula. Matter of fact, marketing is just math. Another one in there inside of marketing is search engine optimization. It's the basically the internet, Google, is the world's largest marketing program. Most businesses don't pay attention to it. And so understanding what are the numbers? How many people search for what you do? How many people search for any, ind any industry? What is the search volume? And are, is, is, are you found? If you're not found, well, then the competition will find you or the competition is found instead of you, meaning the business has to go to the competition. It can't come to you. So again, I tend to focus on the under $10 million companies. And so this is a huge blind spot. They totally ignore it. Second pillar is sales. And so um, studies were done a long time ago that said that if, if you touch um, a prospect at least seven times, the probability of that customer buying is significantly greater than less than seven. So this little tipping point is a seven point touch process. So for those of you that have a business, this is very common in the project management world or project managers. You go meet with a client. Maybe they found you on the internet because you did good pay-per-click advertising or you got a good referral or something. You go and you meet with them and you go away and then you send them a proposal. That would be three steps or three touches. You need to figure out how you get seven at least seven because statistically that is where there's a tipping point. And that might involve sending them some videos, sending them some materials, sending them some white papers, um, having a couple conversations long before they could buy. And you really would want to do that in order to have a higher as the next one conversion rate, the percentage of people that buy from you. So, um, you know, in each of these pillars, there's about a dozen or so things I go through in my book, right? And think about, all right, what else is ignored or a blind spot in a business under sales? So you could be a salesperson in an organization and just focus on the sales pillar and go through this. Like uh, maybe you guys are familiar with DISC um, or other behavioral models. So, you know, how good are you at speaking in that person's language? And I don't mean Spanish or English or Chinese. I, I talk about speaking in DISC. And this is something that's huge. Matter of fact, a monstrous blind spot. I've watched some of your, some of your presentations, right? And you're speaking in your language. You're not speaking in the recipient's language. Meaning, are you direct to the point? Very quick, fast paced, loud even. Are you methodical? Are you good melody in your speech? If you have good melody in your speech, more people will listen. More people will actually learn. Do you throw some comedy in? Do you do different things? Matter of fact, have you even taken a speaking class? If you do, that's a of presentations, could you go off and invest a couple hundred dollars on how to become a better presenter? I've not met very many project managers that have because I listen to their very, very boring speeches. That could be a blind spot. That could also be denial. I don't know, somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Uh, conversion rate is the percentage of people that buy from you. 
most businesses don't know their conversion rate. What are the methods you use to increase conversion rate? Speaking in somebody else's disk, speaking in their language, meaning if they're an S or a C or an I or a D, you figure out what they are and then you talk in their language. Operations, here's a huge blind spot for almost all businesses. Operations is in charge of generating raving fans. Marketing is not in charge of creating raving fans, nor is sales. The operations department's job is to generate raving fans. So simply said customer service, but when you think about it, is customer service trying and, and, and methodically working on building raving fans? Usually not until it's asked. Uh, I love this one uh, for operations in terms of hours of operation. I do have lots of clients that are restaurants um, and restaurants tend to rent space. And the rent doesn't change regardless of their hours of operation. So what prevents a business from being open 24 hours or 18 hours versus a, cof a coffee shop that's open 6 a.m. to 2 p.m.? How could they really leverage all the hours of a day that they're paying rent on? It's usually just labor and electricity. So understanding what is the math necessary to have hours open more, um, and that's typically a blind spot. Finance, really quickly. Finance, um, it's interesting how cash, I'll get the bottom one there. How is cash, um, what is going on in the cash world related to finance? So some businesses almost are irrelevant, don't even care about COVID because they've got cash reserves. One of those companies is Apple. Apple has six years of operating cash flow in the bank. Six years. While, I don't know, United Airlines might have three months. So what, you know, sometimes companies take too much cash and put it back into the business to grow too fast and don't hoard enough cash. I used to pre-COVID make sure all of my clients, again, small clients have at least three months cash in the bank in case of problems. Here in Houston, we have hurricanes. Um, of course, there's natural disasters and things like that. Usually three months was enough cash. Now I'm saying changing that to six months. You must have six months cash reserve for whatever could happen. Um, finance, a lot of times people say, well, I, I don't have enough uh, profits and they would call that a uh, problem in the finance pillar. Really typically cash or having enough money is related to sales or marketing, not related to finance. Um, margins does belong in finance. Uh, one of my clients a long ago only had about a 7% profit margin business, but high volume. Problem was they always lost money and the business model indicated they would never make money because their margins were too small. They grow to a certain size, have to have more overhead. Next thing you know, they're back into, you know, losing money. If I don't get them to change their business model, they will never have profits. That is a finance pillar element and part of margins. Uh, team, I know a lot of us deal with team issues a lot. Uh, a blind spot for small, medium-sized businesses is making sure there's a career ladder. If you have a business, by the way, um, and, you, and you don't have a career ladder, that's a blind spot. It's really interesting. You may be able to hire a fantastic rock star. If a rock star doesn't see a future, they're gonna move. I actually started my first business because the business I was at, I was absolutely a rock star. I went from being a, a type a typist, a word processor, to uh, operations manager in about three years. Um, I'm up there at this operations manager level. I helped them move into three different offices. And at one point they said, Doug, um, we need to stop growing. Business has slowed down. I just need you to chill out for a month or two. 
The next day I quit, gave my notice and started my own business. Because I'm like, I can't sit still. So career ladder is a critical element for rock stars. And if you can't have rock stars or you don't keep rock stars, then you just kind of keep uh, the bad apples. Another interesting blind spot is the concept of leader versus manager. I'm sure we've all read, maybe some of us have written some really good books, certainly read lots of books about leaders, not much on management. Well, it's interesting how critical management is to manage people and resources because you have to. And so inside the book, I talk a lot about what's the difference between a leader and a manager and how smaller businesses have to go from, well, have to become managers first, leaders second. Otherwise, they will lead themselves into bankruptcy. Because the leader is the raw, raw, the spirit, the, that piece of the business that is critical. But it's much more critical to manage a sales process, much more critical to manage operations and finance long before you could ever become a leader. Um, so these are just some of the examples of blind spots. Of course, it would take a very long time to go through all of the book, but I just wanted to kind of do a, a quick 20 minute overview of blind spots and then kind of, you know, open it up for conversation to see what is it that you guys think are blind spots that exist in your world. Thank you, Doc. See, see faces. I'm uh... Usually I ask people to put their questions on the chat and then I'll give them the mic. I've been thinking about blind, storms or blind, blind spots on, on projects when you were reflecting, uh, when you were going through your pillars. And one that comes very often, uh, at least in the projects I see is some of your indicators might be red, like maybe you are running out of budget or so, but the benefits that the project will deliver, we don't know them. Often they're blind spots. So often benefits in projects are guesses and at best. So I was thinking, yeah, this is something that I come across very often. Blind spots around the benefits of the project it's a mystery. Can you and, relate to that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I mean, in, in, in the project manager world, right, we look at all of stakeholders mm -hmm. and try to look at all the benefits as well as the limitations that each stakeholder provides, right? But different perspectives will help eliminate blind spots. But you've got to be pretty thorough about it. And I, I love the question, um, what question have I not asked yet? What, yeah. what question have I not asked yet? Because um, that kind of leads us into the, what am I not thinking about? What am I not paying attention to? And, you know, all of, all, all of PMI has all the questions to ask. If we're pretty good as project managers and we're following all of that, you know, that gives us the great structure. But then the what's missing? You know, as you just mentioned, Antonio, if we don't figure out really good benefits, then which part of this project will fail? Which stakeholder won't participate? As a fact, which stakeholder might sabotage the business, right? Um, and sabotage is a pretty interesting reality. Right? And it may not even be on purpose. It may be subconscious sabotage, Yeah. Right? but not participating just because you don't see any benefit. And next thing you know, project doesn't necessarily work out so well. Another question, Doug, while we hear from the others is, what blind stops do you see if you coach uh, project managers or the CEOs for developing to become better? It, can you share a bit on, on um, one or two typical ones? Uh, well, I think DISC is probably the, the one I go to a lot uh, because people don't recognize 
they could actually learn different elements. You know, they could learn how to have fun. Could learn that. I mean, I think everybody likes to have fun, but people doesn't necessarily get good at learning it. Like that could be one element that we're not very good at. I, I mean, I'm one of those. Didn't yeah. necessarily pay attention to that. I mean, I, you know, let's say I, I like to do this. I like to do that, but I didn't necessarily go, hmm, but I need to do that more. I should have more fun. And there's a lot of leaders out there that are just go-getters. They just do because they consider that fun. Like, well, is that really fun or is it just you in autopilot mode? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So DISC is really important because, you know, if you walk up here, I love this little example because we should all relate. You've all gone into a meeting and the meeting starts off with this. Hey, Lars. Hey, Tom. Hey, Freddie. How was your weekend? What was, what'd you do this weekend, Antonio? And half the room is like, maybe more than half if it's project managers, say, can't we just move on? I scheduled an hour for this meeting and we're talking about the weekend. Yes. Yes. Well, that's ignoring half of the population. See, because the other half, you walk into the meeting and go, all right, let's get started. It's 10 o'clock. Time to go. And you get right into it. Half the room goes, why is it that they never ask about my kids? Why is it always business, business, business? You know, I'm here for a reason. I'm, I'm here to have fun. I'm here to enjoy life. I'm here to blah, blah. Well, about half of the world expects the how was your weekend conversation. Half. Yet, we don't start the meetings thinking about the other half that we aren't. We do our meetings the way we are, not the way they are. Right. And that's a monstrous blind spot out there in the world. Good one. It's a, yeah, it's a really good one. Um, There's so, one question while we, uh, there, Andre, you want to raise your question to Doc? It's a good one. Hey Doc, thank you for the presentation. Just one question. Who do you think is better prepared for understand blind spots in business? The best or the generalists? Um, the specialists, if they could be generalists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you could, because I'm a specialist at small, medium sized businesses. Absolutely specialist, right? But I'm really good as a generalist if I understand your perspective. And so, you know, and all of us can be specialists, but it's just being able um to i mean empathy is the real answer being able to step into somebody else's shoes see and feel what they're going through and then step back and so that would be a generalist skill set that i would encourage not sure if i answered that very well um thank you oh well, you think you think that the soft skills it's 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 prefer as uh, hard skills? Um, well, it's, I have a three hour keynote and the keynote's titled My, um, Mindset or Skill Set, which is more important. So that's a three hour keynote. And I'll tell you the last slide of the keynote is your mindset is a skill set. Work on your mindset as if it was a skill. Very strong. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Doc. There's one question from John and then Lourdes. John, can you come? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. So, Doug, uh, it was a nice overview of how you describe how you can help function, you know, within a business and with the optimizing mm -hmm. you can improve your, your growth potential. Um, you know, sometimes I see that 
growth opportunities are really significant in their cross-functional life. Uh, and DuPont, I believe, are innovation uh, practice, which is cross-functional R&D, marketing, sales, all that. And there's really some great growth opportunities there. So do you see, you know, businesses, you know, really kind of focusing more on a functional perspective and you say, well, actually, if you improve that, it can help. But there's really another level of growth that you can do by really thinking cross-functionally and tackling things like innovation to to really enable growth or customer experience, things like that. So there's kind of another level of, of, um, of growth. And from a project management perspective, these things are really hard because now you're like leveraging the organization and you have to lead these initiatives, which are all these functions. So I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. That what's uh, sometimes blind spots and then denial, right? Because sometimes, especially DuPont and other big companies know they could do this. Like we could put together cross-functional uh, teams to just think outside the box, right? What does the world need that we could create, right? And so, you know, making that happen is something that we know we should do, but then we don't do. Whether that's denial or blind spot, I'm not sure by, you know, by definition, it's probably closer to denial. Um, and it's, it's, it's those kinds of things that, you know, we can call it a blind spot going, all right, we, sh you know, um, we're not paying attention to our, our side mirrors. We're not turning, you know, we're not really doing some of these things. And so, you know, I kind of would think that it's, it's kind of somebody's job to make sure that's happening. And, you know, not having that, you know, is a big problem for big companies. Yeah. Um, for smaller companies, it's the basics. There's so many. And, I, and it's really interesting because I see this in big companies too. They're not even doing some of the basics. I, I was working with an extremely large, I don't know, I don't they had 80,000 employees um, in Argentina. And going through all of the basics in blind spots and like 80% of the things that are in blind spots, the book, they weren't doing. Like 80%. I'm like, how about we guys just go do that? What would that do to the bottom line? What would that do to retention of customers, retention of employees? So, you know, sometimes it's, you know, got to be um, thinking about the future, right? But then sometimes it's just, hey, let's just make sure the basics are covered before we go play in, you know, somebody else's sandbox. Thanks. Well, thank you, John, for the question. Lourdes, where are you calling from and what's your question to Doc? Hi, Antonio. Hi, Doc. Thank you for the session. Um, my I'm, I'm calling from Venezuela, Caracas. And my question is uh, as well related with uh, project management. Since we may have some blind spots in the project, um, within, uh, sometimes we are performing projects with customers, with third parties involved. Um, imagine have a blind spot from those sides that we even have visibility to, to see what is going on in the customer organization or in the third party organization. So what do you recommend for those blind spots that even are outside of your organization? Yeah, no, great question. I think the best thing to do is sort of like I've done in terms of business, put it into these pillars, marketing, sales, operations, finance, and team, is in a project, do the same thing. Separate it out into the different elements, right? So you got whether it's stakeholders, maybe safety, construction, um, and then say, all right, what, um, what are we not looking at? If we just spent two hours in each one of these little areas and what am I not looking at? Right. And, and just start asking questions and, and get rid of the denial that we've looked at everything. We haven't. Help people understand there are things that we haven't looked at. What might those be? Right. And, and somebody will have a story. Well, you know, back when blah, something I didn't look at was something. Here's an interesting blind spot. What if chief project manager gets sick? Then what happens? 
what happens if you know this goes away i, I love this particular question um because i always ask it at the beginning of a small business we call it alignment um i say so you guys have three kids and they go yeah i have three kids um and so any more it's always amazing about half the time half one of the spouses say, yeah, we're done. The other one says, no, we're not. I'm like, what? So what's going to happen? My next question to them is what's going to happen when, in this case, the woman is out for maternity leave and she's the one running the business. Well, we haven't talked about that. It's a blind spot. So, you know, blind spots tend to be unknown to a lot of people, but when you involve more people, the blind spots start to appear. So it's the asking the questions that matter most, um, whether it's third party customers and your value as a project manager goes up exponentially when you help them find a blind spot. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Milan, where are you calling from, Milan? Milan, from Milan maybe. No, based on the last name. <laughs> Hmm. Personal life, I see. Milan? We don't hear you. Kind of heard the background. Can you hear me? Barely. I'm thinking of what of your system can be used. Very far. Can you read my question, please? No, we hear you very far, Milan. If you cannot get closer or so, we can read your question. Give it one more try. Please read my question. Okay. I can barely hear. I'm going to read yeah. your question. What of your system can be used to see blind spot in a personal life? Any recommendations of other system for personal life blind stop? Mm -hmm. That's uh, a whole new world there. It is, and it's the same, right? What are the categories to think about? So uh, joy, right? So, you know, project managers were, were pretty good at this particular question. Maybe not uh, the word joy, but on a scale of one to 10, one being, zero, one being low, 10 being high, how would you rank yourself on joy? Being joyous in your life, right? And then, well, what could you do to bump it up two points? So even though the word joy and having joy in life is not necessarily ignored, right, but not necessarily paying attention to might be a blind spot. Uh, could be um, faith, regardless of faith, right? Do you, uh, I mean, someday I wanna create the church of you because it doesn't matter about the faith, it's about you. What are you doing to have a, a, a happier life, right? And that could be having really strong religious faith, or it could be that you've got to you know, invest in you more. Um, wealth is the one that I kind of touch on a lot, right? How much are you helping others because of your own wealth? Are you complacent? Are you comfortable and not doing anything more because you're just complacent? You haven't gone out there and earned enough so you can take care of yourself and take care of your family and then start taking care of others. So all of these things are all related to personal, right? Uh, it, it just, you know, even even part of this last weekend and maybe it was Thursday when I got the email about the exchange students. So F, uh, we have hosted 11 exchange students over 11 years, right? And you know, it was a lot of fun. And so haven't been doing it, been work focused on the business and things like that. And it is one of the things that allows me to share wealth and share the world with some kids from around the world. And just being able to do that is me focusing on one of the blind spots of my life and that's sharing what I do with others. So all of those things, even, you know, um, 
I don't have time to teach it, but we teach a formula for change, right? And formula for change is understanding what causes us to change ourselves, what causes customers to change, what even causes a prospect to change from not using us to using us. And part of it is understanding that there's dissatisfaction with them not using us, meaning they've gone to somebody else and they're not happy or something. But I was looking at it from a weight perspective, losing weight. So back to the personal thing, what's a blind spot related to personal weight? Well, might be ignoring or blind spot is that, you know, if you're overweight, especially if you're obese, you're going to die 10 to 20 years earlier than you need to. A decade to two decades, right? So that's like possibly 10%, 15% of your entire life could be expanded if you were not obese. So maybe that blind spot is not a blind spot. So then you go through the process of, okay, what do I have to do? Well, a blind spot might be, well, exercise, exercise, exercise. Well, a little bit of studying discovered that, no, it's more about food, what you eat, more than what you do. So if you get your calorie count down, exercise up a little bit, but calorie count down, right? I mean, I lost 40 pounds uh, in a year because the blind spot was made aware that maybe I can help more people if I live longer. So if I wanna help more people, I should live longer. And therefore I start to remove, as soon as the blind spot is no longer blind, hopefully you start doing stuff and you take action. Um, and that's really what I try to do, help people get rid of a blind spot and then start learning and then doing. Thank you, Doc. It's, uh, I, I, I think I love these topics where you can translate them to your personal life, these tools and techniques and for your business, for your career. And I think you are on something very interesting, these blind spots. I, I, I found it very interesting. I, I do want to finish on time. I know you are quite, quite busy, Doc. Uh, um, how can we get uh, your book and, and help you um, if there's anything we can do? I do. Yeah, I do have, a, a, so I'm also teaching how to write a book uh, because as I've gone through all of this, I discovered there's actually a process, a system to write a book and I followed it. And a lot of people from MG100 helped me make it happen. So um, the fee to be in the, the program is give away 50 copies of my book of which if you like, I will refund your $50. <laughs> so there's actually no fee. Um, if you go to the, the website, uh, businessblindspotsbook.com, there's information there. Um, I've just asked people, you can go to Amazon, get it. It's on Kindle for 99 cents. Uh, if you'd like to be in the book launch club, give it away. All you gotta do is put 50 email addresses into a little box on Amazon and you've given it to 50 people. Again, I'll refund that if you like. Um, but then I will, I've got a couple of uh, past recordings. I got a couple more interviews and processes uh, coming up on how to write a book, how to market a book, how to sell a book. Um, lots of people are giving away 50 copies and they've already written their books, so they don't need that. But if you would like to learn how to write a book um, or even just like to give away 50 copies, that would be great benefit to me, helping me get the rankings up there. Um, and I will type it in the questions box here right, right now businessblindspots.com. I will share that with the recording and, and put the link. Yep. And um, yeah, it's very generous. It's, uh, we'll see if we, can, if we can help with the reading the book and, and, and commenting on, on social media. It's always useful. Yeah. We're here to help Please, each other. Yes. Yeah, anything you can do, help fellow PM peer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. But yes, you're right. I do have a client at, uh, at the top of the hour. So uh, really appreciate Antonio being here. Uh, hope you guys got something out of today. If anybody owns a business, um, it's a huge tool. Grab the book. It's 99 cents. Yeah. I promise you'll get a huge ROI. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you and keep yeah. safe. Keep Please well. keep safe. Yeah. All right. Take, take care. Take care.